So hi everyone, um, welcome to the 2021 Stellar Society Lecture here um, from Guilford Technical Community College. We're part of the North Carolina Science Festival. Festival's in its fourth week this year. There have been lots of cool events around the state, lots of them virtual like this one, some in, in person. We hope you've had a chance to um, check out some of those and to um, check out the remaining events for the rest of the month. Um, just use your favorite search engine and look for NC Science Festival and uh, you'll be able to link to a calendar and see all kinds of cool events for some homegrown science in North Carolina. I've got my official festival shirt on tonight. Um, this particular lecture was going to be part of the North Carolina Science Festival last year, but uh, with the eruption of COVID, um, a lot of events got canceled and postponed and we weren't allowed to have this talk last year. Um, this year's speaker was last year's speaker, and so she's um, happily we, we've got her back this time to, to have the talk. Um, it's our 10th Stellar Society lecture. Uh, the Stellar Society is Guilford Tech's Astronomy Club, and they over the years have supported Klein Observatory through um, using some of their club funds and volunteering, and they came up with the idea that we should have this lecture every spring and bring in a, um, a big name or a regional name um, to um, give a talk. And uh, we folded it into the North Carolina Science Festival um, around the same time because it got off the ground about a decade ago as well. And so it's been a nice partnership and we're really excited about tonight's speaker and we're glad she's here. We missed her last year. Um, we had um, a nice session this afternoon with um, the Stellar Society Club members hanging out talking science with Dr. Cleves and based on that I'm sure that you're going to enjoy tonight's talk. Um, I'd also like to thank the GTCC Foundation uh, for helping make this possible. Um, they support all of our events here and uh, it's the donations to the Foundation for Client Observatory programs that many of you maybe in the audience have made that make these kinds of events possible. So thanks to the foundation and thanks to you for supporting the observatory. <clears throat> so we're excited tonight to have Dr. Ilsa Cleves from the University of Virginia to give um, the 2021 Stellar Society lecture. She is currently um, an assistant professor in the astronomy department at Charlottesville and the chemistry department. She also has an appointment there and she's uh, an adjunct scientist at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, also in Charlottesville, so she seems to work everywhere up there. Uh, before going there, she was a Hubble postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Her um, PhD came from the University of Michigan, where she did work similar to what sh she's going to be talking about now, and her undergrad degree in, in astrophysics is from Rice University. Um, she's a, a rising star in, in astronomy. She's uh, well decorated for, for the research that she's done. She received the Annie Jump Cannon Award of the American Astronomical Society, which is a, a recognizes um, important work that young astronomers do. And she was uh, awarded a Packard Fellowship in 2019. Um, so let me turn things over to Dr. Cleves. Um, she's doing really exciting work tell, uh, figuring out how solar systems form and how planets form. So Dr. Cleves, take over and uh, welcome. All right, great. Can you hear me? Yep, we've got you. All right, great. And um, um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining and for having me this evening. I'm sad uh, that I can't be there in person, but I'm glad that I can reach you all, uh, at least in, in this form here, now that we have um, so many wonderful digital platforms um, to, con to connect with each other. Um, I'm excited to tell you about, um, in this lecture, uh, walking through our current understanding of the formation and the origins of planetary systems, both our own solar system, but also uh, planets orbiting very different types of stars, uh, distant stars, so-called exoplanets. And so this is a really exciting era for exoplanetary science. We're uh, not only finding new exoplanets every single day, it seems, um, but we're also starting to learn a lot about them in detail. We're starting to learn a lot about their compositions and even the detailed compositions of their own atmospheres. 
So these are planets around distant stars that we've never traveled to, and yet uh, we're, we're learning um, so much about them and, and everything about their properties. And so uh, this talk will be sort of our view of the origins of our, our current understanding of those compositions of these exoplanets and our solar system planets. Um, and, and trying to do this by studying specifically uh, how um, and where these compositions come from by studying the environments that the planets are forming out of. Uh, we call these uh, environments around young stars, so-called protoplanetary disks. So you'll hear the word disks quite a lot in this talk. Um, these are disks of material encircling very um, young stars in the first few million years of their lives. And they, they form the building blocks of that future generation of planets. Um, this area of research, planet formation, is an incredibly rapidly growing field, um, especially in the last decade. Uh, new facilities, new observational facilities have been coming um, online and are soon coming online, uh, hopefully later this year, that will shed brand new light on the planet formation process. Uh, and, and hopefully solve many of our questions, but also inevitably uh, introduce many, many more. And so um, before digging into that, uh, I, I want to just sort of introduce what we what we currently understand um, about uh, planetary composition. And the first you know, example of our current understanding and also our current uh, lack of understanding is actually not that far from home. It's, it's our own Earth. Um, Earth, while you know, we have an up close and personal view of this planet, there's still tremendous uh, open questions around the composition of Earth, both its solid rocky component, but also the, the liquid compo component. Uh, where did the oceans come from, for example? And we don't understand entirely uh, why it has um, the carbon abundance it does. It's actually really lacking in carbon, even though it feels like carbon and carbon light very uh, uh, carbon based life is everywhere we look. Um, it's actually a relatively carbon poor rock. Uh, we don't entirely know what's even in the core of our earth. Uh, what does it have? Um, um, what does it have beyond the iron and nickel core that we know? There's something else hiding in there, something a bit lighter. And so there's a ton of questions surrounding just our own earth, tons of puzzles that we have yet to, to really understand. Going a bit further, I think this is, yeah, there we go. Um, going a little bit further, uh, you know, just a step out from our Earth, we don't actually have to go outside of our own solar system to see the diversity of, of planets and moons and, and examples of the outcome of the planet formation process, uh, showing us that uh, so many different possibilities are, 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 are out there. Um, Jupiter as just one example, it's mainly hydrogen and, and helium, like our sun. Uh, it has ammonia and, and water-rich clouds. It has a uh, odd puzzle, though, with its oxygen abundance. Um, the early Galileo probe seemed to suggest that the water abundance in the planet, in the atmosphere of Jupiter, was really low. And so um, Juno is, is uh, going to shed light on this uh, very soon and tell us sort of definitively what's going on uh, with these other species like, like oxygen and the water and carbon um, as well in the atmosphere of Jupiter that looks so, that looks so strange. Um, other uh, interesting puzzles here, uh, Enceladus, uh, one of my favorite moons, has an icy crust and a giant global subsurface ocean uh, surrounding or engulfing a rocky core. And so um, from Enceladus, we can see plumes coming off and we see uh, water coming out of Enceladus via these plumes and, and high temperature minerals that have been cooked at the base of these, these oceans. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting puzzles there and, you know, interesting uh, uh, to, to think about or speculate about what, what lies beneath in that, that deep subsurface ocean. Um, Titan is a wonderful, uh, really neat example. It's one of the, the um, future uh, NASA uh, targets via the Dragonfly mission. Um, Titan is really a bizarre moon in that it's actually quite similar uh, to our Earth, the only other body in our solar system with liquid, uh, with liquid surface oceans, although they're not made of water. Um, they're more made of a, like a hydrocarbon soup because uh, it's so cold that the water freezes into solid form. And so you have this amazing diversity even uh, out of the same, in the same planetary system that formed out of that same initial uh, young protoplanetary disk of our sun. Going a step beyond our solar system, uh, like I said, new exoplanets seem to be discovered every single day. Uh, there are examples of um, 
hazy, rocky water worlds that seem to be uh, losing their atmosphere. Actually, a great example of, of, of atmospheric loss here is the case of WASP-121b, where the tail of, a, of an atmos of atmospheric loss was seen um, as a shadow as the, the planet crossed the star. It, was, it had a sort of typical exoplanetary transit, except for the fact that it didn't stop. It had a long shadow, a long tail afterwards. Um, there are planets uh, around carbon-rich stars that have such high densities that if the planet itself had uh, also inherited some of that carbon, the pressures would be so great. It, would, it was uh, so-called, uh, so nicknamed the diamond planet. This is 55 Cancri E. And so uh, these are um, wildly different examples of exoplanets here that, that, are, that are not anything like what we have in our own, our, in our own solar system. In addition to these like specific examples, uh, we're also in this era of exoplanet statistics and we're starting to learn about the diversity of architectures of these other planetary systems. One of the neat features that came out of the Kepler data set is that it seems like at least um, it's not uncommon uh, to have tightly packed systems of planets, tightly packed configurations where when I animate this shortly and I hope the audio doesn't play, we'll see soon. Um, on top of the the, uh, the dash lines here, which indicate the orbital positions of the planets in our solar system, uh, overlaid are all of the known Kepler planets as of 10 years ago. So this is already in itself out of date, but it will already show you the amazing diversity that was seen even at that point um, of, of the diversity of architectures. These are little tiny planets whizzing around their surface, their, their host stars at very close distance. There you see them going. There, I'll turn the audio down just in case. And it's gonna zoom out here. So, you know, our entire inner solar system is represented in the central region. And here you have systems where you have multiple gas giants orbiting well within the, or, uh, within the distance of, of our own planet Mercury's orbit. And so this is completely different from our picture and our understanding of our solar system and sort of has thrown wrench, a wrench into our understanding of planet formation at large, which was mainly de described or mainly designed to explain our solar system and not this very, very bizarre um, uh, 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 set of exoplanets that are very tightly packed. All right, um, there we go. And in addition, to that, we, we don't have to rely on such, you know, these kinds of cartoons, these animations of, of orbital, um, properties of exoplanets. This is a really nice time sequence data of a uh, data set of HR 8799, uh, a, a 10 to 20 million year old um, planetary system where the planets are here, 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 and here. And when I hit play, you're going to get to see them move. Uh, and these are relatively massive, you know, more than Jupiter mass or Ju Jupiter mass ish, ish uh, gas giant type planets that are young and self luminous. And so um, they're still warm from their initial formation. There we go, I'll play it one more time. And you can see them orbiting their central star. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. And there's a scale bar to, to show you. Um, so 20 AU, the orbital distance of Pluto is, is something like 40 AU. So you, you have massive gas giant planets orbiting at distances that exceed even Pluto's orbital distance in our solar system. To me, the most amazing thing out of this data set was that because the planets uh, B, C, D, and E were self-luminous. They all were able to have the light split into the, into the corresponding spectra for each of these planets. And uh, from each of these spectra, through detailed model fitting, um, the authors were able to derive the compositions of the molecules that made up the atmosphere and also then extract interesting information like the carbon over oxygen ratio um, in the, the planet's atmosphere. And so we'll come back to this, this very important ratio uh, in this talk later. So um, where does this all, all this, this compositional diversity, this orbital diversity, where does it all come from? So if you look at our own solar system, you get your first clue. Uh, first off, if you look at the planets and the orbits, um, on the whole, they pretty much all fall into the same flat plane. Here you have Pluto, of course, the oddball, um, but for the most part, the planets um, the, of the eight planets of our solar system fill this plane. And so this is not a coincidence. Uh, this is a remnant of the original protoplanetary disk that formed our planetary system. The disk itself uh, was just a natural part 
of the evolution of, of forming a star and planetary system in the first place. You have some initial molecular cloud that will gravitationally collapse. And with a little bit of spin, uh, it will naturally set up a, a, a disk around a, a gravitationally dense object that's uh, eventually going to form into your young uh, protostar. It's getting fed through this early disk uh, by material infalling from that remnant cloud. Once the infall or the feeding stops, uh, you're left with a long-lived protoplanetary disk uh, surrounding a mostly formed star, uh, which has about you know 10, maybe 20 million years to assemble its planetary systems, uh, at least its gas giants, uh, before you uh, have the sort of longer-lived uh, uh, planetary system. And this can evol the evolution and formation can continue well on, you know, hundreds of millions of years after the dispersal. You have lots of collisions of rocky bodies, but there's no more gas left. And so, whatever Jupiter is or whatever gas giants you you form, that's that's what you've got to work with. And so, if we look at one of uh, these disks, the typical properties are that they're mainly molecular hydrogen, just like our sun. That's that's no coincidence. Uh, they have some amount of helium. And then everything else that makes up us and, and all of our planets and, and all of the sort of interesting things, including life, uh, are, are fairly trace species. Um, so the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, and so forth. In the dusty component, the dust makes up about 1% of the mass of these disks, mostly in the form of gas. Just 1% is what makes up you know, things like our Earth, our, our silicate-rich Earth. Um, these dust grains uh, act um, they do many things. They they uh, will um, change the, the the physical and chemical properties of the disk. And if they get cold enough, they'll start to freeze, uh, have ices freeze out and to form shells around them. Um, so you form things like water and CO2, ammonia, formaldehyde, uh, lots of sort of simple ices like that will freeze out onto these, these cold dust grains. And so when I say cold, I, I mean something like 10 Kelvin and warm in my book is something like 100 Kelvin, though I'm guessing that this may be cold for many of you uh, across the board. And densities here, we're talking, uh, you know, a million uh, parts per centimeter cubed up to sort of 10 to the 12 parts per centimeter cubed when you're really close to the star. Now, a question uh, around protoplanetary disk science, a central question here is, how do we actually go about converting this nebulous gas and dust and ice rich disk into a future planetary system. What does the machinery, what's the machinery that takes us from uh, point A to point B? There's uh, certainly some clues already in our solar system. We see that the gas giants in the sun, um, they're, they're samples of our nebular disk. They're mainly hydrogen and helium, just like the interstellar medium. This is what is left over of that gas, that gas rich component. The, the terrestrial planets and the, the rocky asteroids, those are remnants of the solids of that, that dusty component um, that, that, would, that remains in the disk itself. Then you have your cometary uh, bodies, the ice-rich bodies, and even the icy, the icy asteroids uh, that tend to carry some of that volatile uh, water, CO2, CO ice, um, and that, that, very, that very volatile material uh, the, the comets are this sort of more pristine record of that information. And within our solar system, there are even more interesting imprints. Um, there's chemical fingerprints of, of, of how planet formation proceeded in our solar system. Uh, these are graphs showing you sort of the amount of carbon relative to silicon uh, in different bodies of our solar system. And, and then over here is just nitrogen relative to silicon. And from this, you know, there's imprints of, of the planet, uh, planet formation's effects. So you have the comets out here that are quite rich in their amounts of carbon and, and nitrogen. Uh, and if you trace this all the way back down, down, uh, down here to the Earth, you have relatively little carbon, relatively little nitrogen. And Earth is also uh, relatively carbon and nitrogen poor, even when compared to, to asteroids like uh, Insatite chondrites, some of the, the feeding uh, asteroids that we think actually probably were some of the formation um, uh, building the, the, some of the building blocks that led up to the formation of Earth. And so there's a lot of information in here. And so we can use this and try to work backwards and understand sort of what happened here. Um, but we're actually not just limited to studying our own solar system. Uh, there are tons of examples um, of star and planet formation ongoing today uh, in the nearby actively star forming regions in our galaxy. 
Um, Orion is one of the most striking, it's not the closest, but it's one of the most striking examples of star formation in action. Uh, this is uh, the, a beautiful picture here from Hubble in the background. And then you see these little tiny um, squares, these postage stamp zoom-ins um, of uh, little tiny uh, stars that are on in the act of forming their own planetary systems. And so you see there in this, uh, this, this, this is a disk seen in shadow against a bright nebular background. So it looks like it's a dark um, lane because uh, it's just blocking light from the, 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 the background uh, nebula. Uh, and then you have all these examples down here of disks that are sort of closer to the center of the action and they're getting a, a disrupted and they're in a bit of a race against um, time. You know, they want to form planets, yet they're also being kind of irradiated and, and uh, destroyed by being in this sort of violent environment. Um, we can study these disks at multiple wavelengths. Uh, this is another system, HK tau, A and B, a binary system. Here you see the star and uh, the disk in uh, um, scattered light or direct light up here. Here is the same system seen in millimeter emission. So these, this is thermally glowing dust grains, uh, roughly a millimeter in size. And so what you're seeing here is now the glowing warm pebbles that are making up future planets. Over here, uh, this is the gas orbiting the star, and the color coding is showing you gas that is either moving away from you, which is red shifted, or blue, uh, moving towards you, which is blue shifted. So you're seeing the rotation of the disk um, um, and its orbit around the star. And then, of course, with enough creativity, <laughs> you can uh, create an artistic representation here um, of such a system. And so these different, these different wavelengths uncover different parts of the process of, of how these disks are assembled and how they're assembling future planets. Now, observing uh, disks in general is a challenging feat. Um, so here to scale, so here's the, the moon and this little tiny circle, this little tiny uh, dot represents roughly the size of a typical disk. And so I don't want you to get ill, so I'm gonna hit play, hopefully this works. <laughs> so we're zooming in now, zooming across the face of the moon to get a cl closer picture, a clearer picture of the typical size of a protoplanetary disk. There it is. You can even see the pixels in the moon. Um, and for scale, I've given some of the, the, the sizes of the resolution of previous telescopes, um, particularly those in the submillimeter, which is what I'll talk about um, shortly, is one of the best wavelengths to observe such disks. Previous generations, single dish telescopes uh, did not have the resolution to really see much detail, such much fine grain structure, uh, because the resolution element was often much larger than even the biggest disks we can observe in the sky. And so the picture um, of, of planet formation, um, our first picture of planet formation was made in 1987, shown here. This is T Tau, T Tari. It's now like the namesake of all uh, disk system um, uh, what we call this entire class of systems, typical of astronomers to do that. And here you have the red shifted and the blue shifted emission, so coming towards you and going away from you, so you see the rotating disk. First observations of a rotating gas disk. Then uh, here um, from another protoplanetary disk system, this one's in Taurus. Uh, this was an interesting case. Uh, the star has moved over. It should be right there. Um, but uh, here you have a trace species, an isotope. And so this became um, uh, one of the first tracers of sort of looking at isotopic chemistry in disks. And this is one of the, the interesting ways in which we want to connect our solar system and its interesting isotopic ratios to these environments by, by studying their isotopic ratios and looking for matches or, or discrepancies. Hubble, of course, you know, came in and, and took those gorgeous images. So this is one of the um, early images from 1995 of an edge-on disk. It looks a lot like a, a flying saucer uh, when viewed from the side. And you have this dark smudge across the sky. You can see the star peeking up here and, and, and more brightly shining here. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is the pancake disk, but just viewed from the, the edge-on configuration, the side configuration. So we're not able to directly see the light from the star, we're just seeing it glance off the surface on the upper and lower side. And so this gave really unprecedented resolution and gave us a lot of information on the, the sort of thickness and the structure. But unfortunately, because of the density of those tiny little dust particles that fill the disk, we didn't have a ton of information about what was going on in the heart of the disk, especially where we think the planets are forming right in there. 
And so this is why radio wavelength light is so uh, such a wonderful tool. Um, and and uh, the the beauty of radio wavelength light uh, is that well we you know we're limited by those early uh, low resolution um, telescopes with a single dish. We can instead use a combination of multiple telescopes in a process known as interferometry to try and actually make um, equivalently uh, the image that a larger telescope would make by spreading out lots of smaller telescopes over a large area. And so we can uh, basically achieve the same, the, the resolution of this sort of fictionally large telescope through a system of much smaller, much more efficient and affordable telescopes. So we can get Hubble-like resolution, HST-like resolution, um, by just separating your telescopes out by um, kilometers and, and distance. And so with this acts like a larger single telescope. And so this, um, this is one of the uh, first observations, the Plateau de Bure. Uh, and so here you see from this, uh, this was an observation of gas and it was sort of forming this ring-like structure, but still it was a pretty messy system, right? We're seeing, you know, there's a ring of gas um, and, and this was interesting because it showed us that disks are highly structured. There, there seems to be something sculpting the gas, perhaps. Uh, and, and so um, uh, led to some interesting theories about companions or planets. Now we have uh, many more examples in the last uh, 20 years. So this is a catalog, the catalog of circumstellar disks. You can go to it down here, there's the link. Um, there are over 250 disks that have been resolved. There are many, many more hundreds, if not even at this point, thousands of known protoplanetary disks. Um, but in terms of disks where we have images, there are over 250 examples and they're constantly being updated, excuse me, here. Um, but really this, uh, this, this era of, of imaging planet formation and action uh, was completely uh, turned on its head in the last decade by the arrival of the Atacama Large Millimeter slash Submillimeter Array or, or ALMA for short. So in the Atacama Desert, it's an incredibly high and dry site. Nothing beats it. Um, it's 5,000 meters elevation, and it uh, provides a, a, an incredible a window, an incredible picture of, of the a submillimeter, uh, millimeter sort of wavelength uh, sky. Um, to give you an idea of what an incredible technology feat this is before we get into the data, uh, here is a picture of a good friend uh, and collaborator, Rude Visser, who was the astronomer on duty. Uh, he tweeted this here of him at the high site with the, with the ALMA telescopes. And um, here for scale, I've now uh, uh, used Rude, who he's uh, himself a very tall, tall Dutch man. Um, but here you can see that the dishes are, are rather are rather extended. So you have now uh, over six, six and a half roughly Rudes across, um, 12 meters in, in more formal units. And uh, the telescopes themselves are spread out over a very large area, um, up to 16 kilometer baselines um, across. And the, the amazing thing about that is it gives us that spatial resolution to act like um, Hubble or even better than Hubble resolution. Um, the neat thing about it is that these connection points are all roads. It's a, it's a completely configurable uh, system. And so you have these transporters that can move the telescopes around and shift our picture. And so here um, is a, an example of, of the improvement in the data. I think the picture shifted, so apologies for that. But here you have the original um, observations of TW Hydra and HL Tau before ALMA. And then here in the post ALMA era, uh, TW Hydra was resolved into this beautiful fine scaled structure and HL Tau here shown on the right, um, shown, uh, showing this, these fine grain rings. And these were both uh, incredible images. It really took our picture of a protoplanetary disk, planet forming disks to an entirely new level and was quickly followed uh, by even larger programs um, that seemed to suggest all of this interesting sculpting and shaping, some of which might be due to planets, or we think at least some is due to planets, um, uh, seems to be common uh, across the disks uh, we can observe. And so the typical resolution element shown in the bottom left corner is like five AU in size. It's very fine grain. So this is a disk science is a very open and active field. Um, there are tons of open questions here, and the point of this slide is to overwhelm you in that we know so little, yet we're asking so many questions and working on so many different aspects of this. Questions like how long are disks around? Um, what you know? What is the typical amount of mass in a protoplanetary disk, and how does that set how many planets can form? Um, what is the meaning of all this ring-like structure? Uh, what about the composition of the disk? Uh, what are the primary forms that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen take? 
uh, what are the most important chemical processes that shape the balance of what a planet might inherit or not inherit from its protoplanetary disk. So, so ALNA is providing a lot of information, but inspiring a lot of new questions clearly. So for me, um, one of the most useful tools in trying to understand the puzzle of planet formation is by using uh, the chemical structure, the, the chemistry of these systems as a tool. Um, the way in which this works is that the molecules that are present in, in space in general, not just in protoplanetary disks, it's extremely sensitive to what the temperature is, the, ultra, the, the radiation field is. Um, you know, there's energetic particles like cosmic rays bombarding it. And so it's like a little probe, a little thermometer of your, your environment where your planets are forming. Um, the molecules themselves can tell you a lot about the local environment they're embedded in, um, depending on how they shine, how what, what kinds of spectral line patterns, they um, uh, ratios they show. You can constrain the properties of the gas, its density, its temperature. And space is itself a very interesting laboratory. It's, a, it's an interesting way to study new reactions. Um, we can see short-lived intermediates um, that can basically not be replicated in conditions uh, on Earth. And so um, while we want to understand the chemical pathways that lead to the formation of habitable planets, um, in fact, sometimes some of these reactions we actually can never study on Earth and can only study in space um, based on the, the low densities and the low temperatures present. So space is an incredibly chemically rich place. Uh, over 200 um, molecules have been now detected in space. Uh, and so here's a table <laughs> sorted by the number of atoms and the molecules that have been observed. I had to truncate the table and copy it over here just to fit it in here. Now, disks themselves are not quite as, uh, uh, have, don't have quite as many detections. Um, so here's a table of the number of molecules that have been observed uh, in terms of the different types of molecules that have been observed um, over time. And so pretty much, you know, we've, we've seen about uh, uh, 13 total molecules, uh, not counting those isotope, isotopic versions. Um, but we are starting to see more and more organic molecules. And right here, this, this inflection point is actually the coming online of ALMA. ALMA's really uh, improved our understanding of organic mole uh, molecular chemistry in disks. So studying these molecules, it's not just collecting, you know, the newest, funnest molecule you know, that we can possibly find. Um, we want to understand sort of that the origins or the fundamentals of that diversity of those of the observed exoplanets. You know, why do we have that? Uh, the diamond planet, why do we get something like Titan with those hydrocarbon lakes, that nitrogen-rich atmosphere? And so we want to under, understand where that comes from. And so to, 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 to ask that question, we actually have to step back even one step further and, and ask the question, where do the molecules and even the atoms that make up those molecules actually come from? Where does that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen budget come from? And so I can't not quote Carl Sagan when you ask that question. Uh, that the, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies, um, were all made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And I think this is something now that's, that's reached popular culture, that we know that this is, you know, what um, we, have, uh, we have. We have these dying stars to thank uh, for the, the origins of our elements. And in fact, I personally like this representation here by Jennifer Johnson showing the, our periodic table but now it's color coded by the origins of all these different species. Um, so where did it come from? Uh, the uh, Big Bang, hydrogen and helium primarily, um, or did it come from exploding massive stars in green, dying low mass stars in yellow, or some combination and they're shaded by, by a fraction. But on the atoms here, uh, while a fascinating picture, it's only actually part of the picture, uh, we need um, to deliver those atoms in the form of molecules uh, into these planetary systems or these forming planetary systems. And this is where astrochemistry comes in. So astrochemistry itself, uh, you know, where is about is a field that's only about a hundred years old in that the first molecules ever detected in space were actually detected on our sun. Um, so we had titanium oxide, um, magnesium hydride. Uh, they were seen at the Mount Wilson Observatory and they were seen primarily uh, in sunspots. So here is an example of a lab spectrum of water, for example, and this is the sunspot penumbra and versus the sunspot umbra for comparison. So you can see the lines start to really pick up when you're in the, the cool region of the umbra uh, compared to the hot, um, hot surface of the, the penumbra. And so 
um, molecules were actually first seen in, in not just interstellar space, but actually on our sun. Um, but now molecules are just common, they're everywhere. Every environment we look, uh, dying stars uh, in, uh, in our sun, in interstellar clouds, um, in comets, uh, in meteorites, uh, every, everywhere we look, in planets and, and so forth. Now this chemistry of, of the rich chemistry of interstellar space, it starts its journey on its way to forming planets by, start, by uh, originating first in cold molecular clouds. Um, these so-called hole in the heavens as designated or as called by William Herschel. Uh, and so this is Bernard 60, 68 seen in optical light. It looks like there's a hole in the heavens, but indeed it's just uh, a dense cold cloud full of planet forming potential. Um, so the densities here are lower than a disk, but they're relatively chilly below 20 Kelvin. Lots of the uh, interstellar light is being blocked. Um, so only about uh, less than a percent gets through. And um, across this particular nebula, this one only is about two solar masses, so it's actually pretty small in what it will form. Um, but there are giant molecular cloud complexes with even more potential. So under these types of conditions, really the types of reactions that occur, um, so, so you really only have the time to have sort of two different molecules, two different atoms come together and react. Otherwise, uh, it's really hard to get three species to come together at the densities of space. And so in the, in the cold uh, interstellar gas um, here, you know, as an example of a reaction you might think that would happen. Um, so here's an example of an endothermic reaction. Molecular hydrogen's everywhere. Um, there's oxygen. So this would be a natural guess to start with how you might form water. Unfortunately, this has a huge, huge energy barrier to overcome. And so even if you tried to sort of turn up the temperature and cook this cloud and try to make water the hard way, um, it would take over 5 trillion years to make water via this sort of very simple first approximation of a reaction. But um, if you add a little bit of extra uh, seasoning to this reaction, if you add a little bit of ionization here and bump into that molecular hydrogen, ionize it and form um, through one more step, another hydrogen atom or, or hydrogen molecule, uh, you'll form H3 plus or hydronium. And now this reaction has no barrier. It wants to proceed and it will lead to the formation of water. And this even can happen at temperatures as low as 10 Kelvin, it takes less than a year to occur, which might sound like a long time, but when molecular clouds are around for millions of years, there's plenty of time to make water in this way. So where did that little, uh, little ionization kick come from in the first place? For me, this is one of the most interesting things. Uh, the same dying stars that, you know, those, the stars that sort of we're populating or polluting our, our uh, periodic table with all of that interesting atomic goodness. Um, they, uh, here, this should actually play, maybe it'll work. Um, this is a simulation of one of those dying stars ejecting carbon and there's iron into the interstellar me medium. That's density, that's temperature. Um, these, these stars are enriching our interstellar medium when they explode. Uh, but they also, in the process of exploding, um, they, uh, also can accelerate energetic particles, so-called cosmic rays, the very things that can actually kickstart that chemistry and ionize that first, that first step, that molecular hydrogen. So dying stars, we have a lot to owe to them. They are not only seeding the material, but they're also powering the chemistry that leads to the formation of things like water and organics. So going from um, now this chemically rich cloud uh, down to the, the, the planet forming environment, um, disks themselves are chemically, highly chemically structured. So if you look at a disk cutaway here, um, the, you have temperature gradients both uh, from the surface down into the cold core. There's a hot surface or the hot inner disk into the cold core. Um, this, these, these dusty, the dusty disks um, will will also, you know, manage or, or filter the light that can pass through it, which changes the temperature and the radiation field that, that can actually reach the cold core, the cold planet forming environment. And so this will naturally set up um, sort of a, a structure where you have uh, an ionized surface, but molecules can survive and you have an icy core and icy mid plane deep within. And so depending on sort of where your planet's forming, you might have different ice uh, compositions um, or different, different gas atmospheres. And so we call this sort of transition point when a molecule goes from being gas to ice, we call this a snow line. Uh, and so in a cartoon sense here, you know, a snow line would just mean you have bare dust grains, in this case, water vapor, and then on the outside of the snow line, you have ice-coated solids. 
And so this would lead to, in this, if your planet formed um, uh, at, at a distance or at, at closer to the star, you might end up with an ice pore core. And then whatever is remaining here in the gas would be, fill your envelope. And out here, if you form, you have an ice rich core as an example, and maybe a uh, volatile core envelope, for example. So this is just one possibility. And so you can get different oops, different compositions. There we go. Uh, depending on where your planet forms, if it's interior to that water snow line, or if it's interior to something, a snow line of something completely different. And so this led to some cool results uh, where uh, if you sort of paint on some typical water, CO2, CO uh, abundances that we know about from molecular clouds, uh, you can create graphs of where you would expect um, the, the, the composition of the, the planets that form to radically shift as you cross over those snow lines. And this was a really neat uh, way of describing it through this, this carbon over oxygen ratio I mentioned earlier, uh, where depending on the location a planet forms, you'll have different compositions in the gas versus the ice, whether you're near the water, CO2 or CO snow line. And so this was really exciting because we thought, hey, maybe if we can measure that carbon over oxygen ratio in those exoplanets, we can link it to the place in the disk they originally formed. So this was really cool. Um, this idea was really cool. So this is the, sort of the theoretical picture here. And you know, this would result in maybe some, some regular patterns of planet composition. Um, but in reality, it's always more complicated. Uh, chemistry can evolve heavily over the course of the lifetime of the disk. You can have mixing between different environments. Ices can be transported throughout. And so really the necessary thing to try and understand what the range of compositions planets can inherit from their, their disk and what they can possibly, you know, what they could possibly look like requires measurements. And so our, we, have a, we have so many windows into planet, planet forming disks. Uh, so, you know, we have both in the inner hot regions, there's um, hot molecular lines seen in the near, near and mid infrared. Uh, Alma is probing this green region, this colder region. The core is this sort of icy, icy component. Uh, the scattered light will come off the surface like what we saw with Hubble. And so you have a whole bunch of different reservoirs. We can probe with different molecules, different wavelengths of light and piece this puzzle together. And so Alma gave us some really um, amazing, um, or Alma is still giving us some really amazing uh, pictures of the different molecules and where they're present. This is just a gallery of a few examples of different molecules and their distributions in different disks. A neat thing about this graph to me is that uh, this, 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 and this, this like sort of these four images all are the same system. And so you have in the same system molecules that have different patterns. So this is telling us chemistry is varying with distance from the star. This, this uh, protoplanetary disk would form different planets depending on where they form. So we can see this in action. Now, um, let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead here uh, and say, um, there we go. All right, so um, when, we, when we get data like that, we can't just you know, take a picture and say it's the end of the day. We can um, take that, that we, what we do is we take the intensity and we'll either make some assumptions and say, hey, um, the intensity of the line is related to roughly how much there is and, and some uh, function of its, its temperature. And so we can approximately estimate how much in this case 13 CO, CO there is in the disk. An alternative way that what my group works on um, is forward modeling where we try to construct a realistic picture of where 13 CO should live and we create synthetic images which we compare to data. And um, as uh, we, uh, we constantly adapt and, and improve our models until we can match uh, what we see on the sky. And, and the beauty of that is it tells us what reactions matter, it tells us what the physical drivers of the chemistry are and, and so forth. But models are really hard, <laughs> they're really complicated. And so uh, head exploding emoji down here is, is not uh, is, is intentional. Um, you have to assume a lot or, or constrain a lot about your source, ideally get observational constraints. Then you have to bombard it with radiation. You have to assume something about the chemical reactions that can occur, and this is something we're constantly working on. Uh, from this, we make synthetic observations and then rinse and repeat. And so um, from this, you know, there's many different ways you can approach uh, computational work, astro, uh, computational astrochemistry. Uh, for the simple molecules where the chemistry is just understood already, we can use those simple molecules as little canaries um, in the coal mine to constrain what the irradiation level is or how much 
energetic bombardment there is uh, and so forth. So this really lets us put our physical um, understanding of planet formation to the test uh, by using simple molecules. More complex molecules that may have poorly understood chemistry, we can use those to understand like if we're missing different types of reactions. Are they forming mainly in the gas or in the ice phase or maybe some combination of the, the two? And so this lets us start to actually test the chemical pathways and if we're getting those right. The neat thing about disks is that they um, take, you know, conventional uh, knowledge of astrochemistry and sometimes throw it out the window. And one amazing way is, you know, that these disks, as they form planets, they're actually changing their own local composition. And so the future planets that form might not look anything like the, pr the first generation of planets. And this is because when those solid tiny dust particles evolve over time, they'll grow, they'll gravitationally settle, and they'll start to drift inward. And so you can end up redistributing icy coated grains uh, completely differently uh, in the disk depending on where you are and, and what time you're looking. So uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, window into, into um, how planet forming, uh, planetary chemistry can change over time. And our observational windows are, are different. So ALMA, have, that I told you about so far, is really good at probing the, the, the vertical surface, the observable gas-rich surface. Um, a, oh, an exciting thing that will be coming up in the near future is the James Webb Space Telescope uh, that will be launching later this year. And the neat thing about it is that it has the capability of detecting the ice, the icy reservoir through um, through mid infrared ice feature or near and mid infrared ice features. And so we should get a complete picture through combined ALMA and JWST observations, especially for disks where they're in these sort of favorable inclinations where we can see the ice reservoir better. So um, a couple of neat connection points I just want to highlight uh, before wrapping up is uh, that we um, have um, uh, some out of Alma, so there have been some really interesting developments in the last five years, uh, namely that there have been certain molecules peaking up that we never expected. Small hydrocarbons are extremely bright, extremely abundant. These molecules are well known, actually from the dying star community, the AGB star community, that they are extremely sensitive to carbon over oxygen ratios. Uh, especially in the gas. And so by measuring their brightness or their quantity, we can start to get a handle of the carbon to oxygen ratio um, in the gas that exoplanet or that planets can accrete. And the neat thing about this is connecting it back to here to HR 8799. Um, the, this uh, particular disk that I showed you here, this is a nearby protoplanetary disk, TW Hydra, that has this hydrocarbon ring. It matches up really well with the same pattern of carbon over oxygen ratios in the exoplanetary system HRD799. This could be total coincidence. Um, in fact, if you look at other disks, they have different ring-like patterns, uh, and that's actually shown here. Um, so hydrocarbons sometimes are more peaked, sometimes they're double ringed, and sometimes they look like TW Hydra. Uh, but maybe this is a way in which we could time planet formation potentially in the future, or at least see what the variety of carbon over oxygen atmospheres are possible. Another really neat way uh, that we can connect um, exoplanets and the potential for, for habitable planet formation to disks is via these future database T observations that we're looking forward to. And here I'm just highlighting some, some neat work that my, um, my postdocs, Dr. Dink Ballard and Dr. Dana Anderson are working on to create synthetic uh, detailed IC spectra of what we should see from a realistic protoplanetary disk uh, viewed from the side in this case. And so depending on what slice you look at, which layer on the disk you look at, you see different ice species peak up uh, because the composition is varying spatially across the disk. So these are the most detailed ice models made to ever uh, to date uh, of, of a protoplanetary disk. Another neat area that we're exploring right now is that we want to localize where the ice presently is. Um, I alluded to the fact that the ice grains are growing, evolving, and moving. Uh, this can be changed um, depending on when you look, so it might be more mixed, it might be more concentrated, but if you happen to have something like a ring or a gap blocking the flow of ice inward to the star, uh, then maybe you have ices locked up in the outer disk that can't actually make their way into the inner, perhaps terrestrial planet forming region. And so uh, understanding where the ice is um, is an exciting topic, and we were um, awarded time uh, with the James Webb Space Observatory, Space Telescope um, in cycle one. Uh, so we found out uh, just a few weeks ago um, that we were able to um, uh, map ice or we're planning to map ice in the V4046 Sagittarius system 
another, another uh, famous disk system. Um, this one is particularly fascinating, at least to me, because it's in this, in, it's really close by, but at the same time, it's the background of this particular disk uh, aligns with a whole lot of background stars you can see here. All those little dots, those aren't artifacts, those are all little distant stars that I've circled now here uh, for you. And there's over 40 background stars behind this disk that let us pierce through and measure the total amount of ice between the, the star and us and, and sort of map out the ice across the face of this disk. And the other neat thing about this data is that we're using the coronography mode on James Webb. And so not only will we get these lines of sight going through the disk and, and getting the ice along the full uh, depth, we'll also get reflected ice features from the surface via the chronograph. All right, so with that, I'm just, I wanted to give you a couple of uh, highlights and, and also just like let you know about uh, where we are in protoplanetary disk science these days and what problems uh, that are keeping us up at night. Um, really, we're motivated or excited uh, by the, all the, the, the last few decades of the characterization of, of exoplanets um, and, and how much we've learned about exoplanets, their diversity, their orbital architectures, their compositions. Um, but also the puzzles within our own solar system. Uh, the fact that, you know, where is the water in Jupiter? Where, is the wa where did the water on Earth come from and the carbon? Uh, where did it go? Um, so over the last decade, um, there have been significant improvements in the observational picture we have of protoplanetary disks, as well as the modeling. We're learning so much about the physical environment and how this, this sort of icy transport actually seems to be a pretty crucial part of the puzzle in understanding what happens for future planets. Um, we're uh, along those lines, we're seeing that the physical environment, the chemistry is extremely well coupled. And so this really, this, this transport of ice seems to be key and has big implications for carbon over oxygen ratios in these newly forming planets. So this will soon be testable with James Webb, actually not only for protoplanetary disks, but also in the atmospheres of, of close end gas giants as well. So stay tuned there. Um, and also the, the I wanna just um, you know point out that a lot of what we've learned um, about protoplanetary disks is from objects which you know we know the names of, but the vast majority of systems, the typical systems that might form something um, probably closer to our solar system, it's relatively poorly poorly known. Um, so we need to go to statistics. We need to go get demographics of the the planet forming potential for for these disks. What is the typical car typical carbon over oxygen ratio? What is the typical amount of mass you have to form a planet? Uh, we don't know these these. Uh, answers to these questions yet, but we can over the next decade. And so this will be an exciting um, decade coming up to start to actually compare to the demographics of, of known exoplanets, as well as um, put our solar system into context. Uh, and I want to just take a second and thank my wonderful research group. Uh, so pictured here, um, I'm, I'm extremely lucky to have such a wonderful team um, behind me uh, doing this, this beautiful science. We all really um, everybody collectively <laughs> misses the normal times when we could observe or present our, our, our uh, science or give public talks. Here is uh, my student, Abby, as well as like make uh, Christmas cookies themed with the, uh, the protoplanetary rings I showed you earlier. Those were the good old days. But I'm, I'm so, uh, you know, wonderfully surprised every day with uh, my group and, and how resilient they've been. Um, and then here is a picture of we, we do these regular events to check in with each other social events and this was us making like spring themed origami so they they, they put up with my my shenanigans and and are, are um, doing wonderful science at the same time so i'm extremely grateful to them um so i, I thank them very much and I, I thank you for your attention i'm happy to take uh, any questions you have so if you have questions um we have a Q&A that you can type them into and um, we'll relay those to our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Shreves, for a, a great talk. Um, do you want to just look over the questions? Can you see them or you want me to read them? I, I actually I can't, can't see them, see them but, but I could close the... Um, no, uh, let me... Uh, so I'll, I'll just read you some. Um, so is our solar system layout and composition unique among the exosolar systems you have studied or are we in line with the others so that's a that's a that's great, a great question. question oh i'm kind of hearing an echo is that, is that uh, okay um um so so the the answer to that is that we're we're still trying we we still don't yet fully know but 
Um, we do lie in a part of parameter space, our, our, our solar system. When you compare it to all the known detections of exoplanets, we do seem to be um, relatively more extended uh, and um, um, have you know gas giants on, on relatively distant orbits or Earth's on a relatively distant orbit. But my, mainly the reason when we for that is that there are selection biases. I wish I actually had a graph of this. I'm trying to describe it with my hands and, and it's really hard. Um, there are selection biases to finding planets that are more massive and closer to their star. And so the I think that we're in a point where we don't quite know how typical we are, but when you correct for um, you know, the, the, the unknowns, the biases and the samples we have, it seems like on the whole, you know, we have a fairly, it seems to be fairly typical, although the most common type of exoplanet, which is a so-called, it's a super earth or, or sub Neptune, depending on like, I guess glass half full, half empty. Uh, we don't seem to have a planet of that class. And that's the most common, t common type of planet that we have found so far in the ex exoplanet catalog. Um, so it, it, we're missing that, but at the same time, it seems like perhaps, you know, we're not that distinct. Our architecture, architecture is not that distinct. Um, the, the compact planets I showed at the beginning, only about 10% of our known exoplanet systems are in that really compact configuration. 90% are more extended like us. Um, but again, we're, we're kind of missing some of the key, key players in our solar system, at least, at least today. I mean, maybe they were there earlier, but um, at least today. And you'll have to unmute. Okay, gotcha. The um, what what caused the jump in the mid '90s in the plot of the <laughs> submillimeter molecule detections? That's a really uh, good question. So there was a a, a, a dedicated survey um, of Andutre uh, right there. Like that was that was entirely like one massive effort. A lot of telescope time was dedicated to finding new molecules. And so, uh, yeah, those major leaps require really big commitments from observatories. And so that was a really big uh, commitment. Um, um, and, and so, you know, we're now with ALMA, we've had this ALMA telescope now for a decade, and we're reaching a point where we're hitting, where the competition is still extremely high, but we're able to sort of go after these risky, deeper observations, um, looking for new molecules, uh, there's new techniques out there for trying to find very faint molecules that we don't even see in our data or aren't even looking for. And so there's some neat um, data type techniques, um, data analysis type techniques. And we're just at a point where it's like we can start to actually explore these, these unknowns, um, uh, chemically speaking. Uh, whereas before, you know, in the early days of ALMA, it was, it was sort of, it was much more difficult to go, to go hunting for something new. I don't know if that was the answer to the question, though. <laughs> is uh, is there anything especially surprising um, in the list of molecules that have been detected so far? What are the most interesting or complex or surprising detections? So uh, uh, there's the um, the lack of uh, there's two there's a couple of things. Um, so so the fact that Early on, um, the surfaces of disks looked very water poor, water dry, um, not just because of freeze out, but the grains themselves looked bare. Now we understand it's because the chemistry really is connected to the evolution of those tiny little dust grains as they're growing and evolving and moving. So the surface is sort of drying out over time. Um, other really cool things, let's see. So um, uh, organics, I, I mentioned organics, um, that those, are, those were, those have been a big contribution, or detections of those have been a big contribution from ALMA. And for example, methyl, methyl cyanide, CH3CN, uh, happened to be the first complex organic seen in a protoplanetary disk. If I, you know, ignoring pause for a moment, um, but for, for a simple molecule, CH3CN, um, that was the first organic molecule seen, even though methanol was the one everyone was hunting for. And so the ratio between those was about one to one. When in interstellar clouds, it was 1% methanol, uh, sorry, methyl, methyl cyanide to methanol. And so there is something bizarre going on with the organics. It's likely tied to the water and likely tied to something, uh, something has to do with the, the drying out of the surface via that, the water ice um, 
getting sequestered to forming larger bodies. Methanols probably go in the same way. Uh, methyl cyanide might be forming more actively. I mean, we don't totally understand, but we are getting weird organic ratios, a lack of water, um, and and actually mentioning pause, you know, for some reason, the, the PA emission, which is so bright in the interstellar medium, is not there in protoplanetary disks. Is it, is it because it's gone grown to larger sizes and we can't observe it because uh, it's fro formed a solid uh, phase? Or was it destroyed by the radiation field from the star early on? Um, those are things that actually, that latter question, J JWST will shed light on. Um, what is the typical distance of the protoplanetary disks that have been studied so far from Earth? I don't know if they mean distance, like size. Yeah. Uh, uh, distance, uh, they're, they're roughly um, 140 parsec away. So, uh, you know, we're talking like 500, 600-ish light years away. So, yeah, they're not in our backyard, sadly. Um, they're pretty far away. The closest one, TW Hydra, is 60 parsec away, and that's and 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 that seems to be. I don't think we found anything closer than that. So no, sadly, we're like not. These are not in our backyard. I mean, exoplanets are definitely in our backyard. We have there are exoplanets um, around the the around nearby stars, primarily the low mass stars, uh, the the M dwarf stars around us. So we know that planet formation has has occurred in the past, but the, the systems we're studying now. The re regions of recent star formation are pretty far away. Um, what does the carbon and oxygen abundance we have at Earth tell you about the disk evolution of our own solar system? What is the, the carbon? The C over O ratio? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, going back to that initial, uh, the initial, you know, plot of sort of the carbon carbon and nitrogen abundances. I mean, we know that from our, our early in our early solar system, uh, something happened to Earth's carbon. I mean, the 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 even the asteroids were pretty carbon poor. And so we know that there were some major events that sort of de de volatilized removed carbon from from the rocky component even before Earth formed. And then something after Earth formed kept it going. Uh, and so we know that that's a process that's, that's actually a pretty hard process to, to, to probe directly via observations because it's the inner disk and the inner midplane. It's one of the hardest parts of the disk to actually observe. Even JWST, so it's, it's a near, it's a, in the infrared wavelength light, we really see mostly the surface and we have to sort of infer what's beneath. It's like an iceberg where you just see the tip and not the, the, the bulk. Um, and so the inner disk, that hot inner disk region, is going to be is, is pretty hard to probe. But the, the ideas out there now is we probably had some maybe some early outbursts um, that heated up the inner disk and converted a lot of the, the refractory forms of carbon into some more volatile forms um, that couldn't be trapped. And so um, that's a it's really a, that's, a, that's a hypothesis. And now with disks um, that are being observed like uh, V8, uh, V883 Ori um, is an currently outbursting disk. Um, it's been recently surveyed um, with its molecular emission, and you can even see uh, the, the transition from water going from gas to ice. You can see a ring of organic molecules being pushed out. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a really neat way to see this from different perspectives, although it's not the same system. Instead, you have to sort of look at the population of, of disks out there and sort of try and piece together how we fit in. But we think it probably has to do with early outbursts, um, shaping the carbon over oxygen ratio, to clarify. Um, what causes the formation of a rocky planet instead of a gas giant, or vice versa? So the, 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 the story we tell, you know, in our intro astronomy classes is that the rocky planets likely had uh, less of a solid reservoir. So they probably formed pretty close to the star where there was very little ice. And then we, you know, then continue the story and say, well, beyond some radius where there's now more ice, more water ice, there's more solids. And you can form larger and larger cores. Uh, at, at some point you reach a, a size where, you know, roughly 10 Earth masses. You have so much mass that you start to like hold on to the nebula itself and accrete the gas gravitationally and capture it into your envelope. And so that's what we say. I mean, we still think that's probably what's happening. But uh, at the same time, 
we are seeing um, large planets orbiting very close to their central star, well interior to where there should have been any ice. And so the question is, did they migrate or did they form in situ? Um, and there's arguments for both, uh, that they formed further out and moved inward and, or that they um, instead formed locally. And, and we should, by getting statistics on those planets' atmospheres, we should kind of be able to see it imprinted actually in their carbon over oxygen ratio, bringing it back to that. Um, so, so hopefully that'll be answered soon as we get more statistics on that key parameter. There's a lot of bias in exoplanetary systems we observe towards hot. Okay, hang on. We observe towards hot, fast, heavy objects as opposed to cold <laughs> stuff in the outer solar system. Can disks help us predict what we should be seeing in the outer solar systems of say, hot Jupiter systems or compact systems? I, yeah, I, I, I think so. And, um, so the yeah, so in the the disks where we're preferentially looking at the outer outer regions, we we are we actually are better tuned to seeing things outside of solar system scales, outside of 10, 20 AU, um, and and you know our solar system gives us the picture of sort of what's going on inside of that radius. And you know if you look at the patterns of rings, um, they do tend to be much more and much further apart, um, uh, for, further out than our own uh, planets. And so maybe there's some hints of migration in action where uh, if you sort of push the distribution of rings inward radially, it starts to match up with the distribution of exoplanets. And so maybe there's some like tentative signs of, of migration in action there, uh, but, but it does offer a complementary perspective. I think that, you know, for, for our solar system, we don't have uh, uh, no data out there. We have, you know, the comets and their, their ice rich compositions. And those will be directly comparable with those sort of ice experiments with JWST. Uh, so we'll be able to sort of see if if, if there's commonality there. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember it. Oh, it was, it was like, can we can we use disks to complement it? I think you know there are other ways I, to to figure out what's going on in the outer disk. Sorry, the the outer exoplanet population. Uh, there's also microlensing as another cool avenue to find exoplanets very far from their their star. Um, but I, it's very complementary indeed to to what we can study with disks, which is much further out. Besides JWST, is there significant potential with any of the new super large ground based telescopes, mm -hmm. TMT, ELT, for instance? Yeah, the new class of extremely large telescopes uh, that 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 are either being planned or are underway. Um, I mean, the ground based, I don't even think I showed any of this data, like even the, the telescopes we have now, especially VLT sphere, have made gorgeous images of the scattered light surface of, of protoplanetary disks. And in some cases have found companions. Uh, PDS 70 is a wonderful example of a system. If you just like Google PDS 70, I promise it will come up. It's a ring and there's a inside of the ring, there's a luminous companion and maybe a second luminous companion. And they have um, hydrogen alpha emission associated with them, which is suggestive that the like material is crashing onto those those planets. And um, so, so you know, with the, the new generation of telescopes, we won't have, you know, a handful or we'll have we'll have more examples of that, uh, especially as you get to sort of more sensitive telescopes, which, which helps us look further away. Um, but also getting to like smaller um, inner working angles on chronographs so you can start to look for planets closer in. Um, so, I mean, the, the possibilities of finding companions are really exciting. And also the possibilities of just like, what do the, what do the substructures look like? All those beautiful on the rings and, and gaps, are they there in the, the tiny grains too? Are they not? Um, it's not always, uh, for the cases where we know it, seems like it's they're different the patterns are different and so we we're trying to understand what that means um haven't one or two amino acids been found in the interstellar medium um, or molecular clouds um have any been found in protoplanetary disks um no, 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 no protoplanetary disks proto 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 but indeed in, in meteorites you know, amino acids have definitely been found 
Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of work going on to understand when, when those amino, amino acids originally formed. Um, and, and there are interesting properties of these amino acids. Uh, they can take, you know, different mirror forms or handedness. Uh, and so, you know, on Earth, life seems to have sort of the same, the same pattern, the same, the same mirror symmetry uh, uh, across across all life on Earth. And so, when did this get started? I mean, there's really fascinating stuff going on out there. Sadly, with discs, uh, the most complex molecule we've seen really is uh, methanol and methyl cyanide. Nothing yet more complex. Uh, we would need we would need more alma, more dishes, uh, not larger dishes like spread out in a larger area but we just need a higher density of dishes so that we could collect more light to find more rare species but i mean amino acids would be hard regardless because those types of molecules to observe them in distant space they're so floppy and they they uh they don't have strong individual transitions uh line sorry spectroscopic transitions Can studying planetary rings in our own solar system tell us anything about protoplanetary disks? Ah, is that, are you referring to the, the like the belts, like the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt? So I think it's, a, I think maybe they meant planetary rings, but go either way uh, with that, okay? Definitely, um, uh, so for planetary rings, yeah, you have the uh, interactions of the shepherding of moons, you know, for the rings of, of Saturn, of Uranus. And so, I mean, that that's that's what's sculpting many of the rings that I showed you. We, uh, there have been so many theories out there trying to explain what could cause the patterns in the rings. And pretty much the vast majority, you know, are, are they're, they're slowly getting knocked down and, and planets are still still raining. So we, we know that at least, or we think that at least some of those, those rings are planets um, that are sculpting uh, out uh, this, this, these same, these, their, their paths along their orbits in the same way the moons are shepherding the rings of Saturn. And so, so yeah, so we can learn a lot. Um, I mean, gas giants are like miniature solar systems. Uh, we think that the, um, the, the ring system itself isn't a remnant, is not a remnant of like a moon forming disk, but we do think the gas giants were surrounded by disks, their own circumplanetary disks. Uh, and out of those, the, co the, the moons themselves coagulated. And there's a lot of interesting questions around those, around circumplanetary disks, because so many of the moons are icy, and yet uh, our physical understanding of those disks points to them being so deep, uh, or so close to their, their, their so deep within the, the planet's gravitational well that they should be really hot. <laughs> and so it's a, a little confusing as to where they got all of that ice. Um, a lot of open questions on circumplanetary disks. But uh, an exciting thing there is that um, Alma, people are looking for a circumplanetary disk dust with Alma and, and um, uh, you know, the, the, one of the planned upgrades for the VLA. Uh, the next generation VLA is, is also suited to trying to find those, those like resolve those pebble disks around planets, uh, the moon forming disks. So a question about you. Um, most, when most people think of astronomy, they don't think of chemistry. So how did you get interested in astronomy in the first place? And then what specifically drew you to um, studying astrochemistry? I, 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 since I was a uh, young, like fifth grader, I, I uh, you know, loved astronomy and found out it could be a career. And so I sort of ran with it uh, throughout, throughout my education, through high school, one of my science teachers loaned me their uh, their own um, their astronomy textbook from college when they were in college, and so like it, it definitely was always my passion. Um, but I also loved other things. I loved building things, and so I wasn't actually sure if I would become an astronomer or an architect. But I decided in the end, you know, I should probably you know learn the basic of physics either way. You know, building should probably stand right. Um, and so I ended up going towards the path of astronomy. And while I was an undergraduate, I found that I kept getting, I kept gravitating, no pun intended, uh, gravitating towards papers about newly forming planets. And that's what helped me zero in personally on why I, uh, in, being interested in the formation environment um, of, of new planets. And I personally love that it's like a field of potential. It's you, you look, you study these systems to try and understand what possible planets can form. 
Uh, and so it gives you, there's a lot of room for creativity in this field. Um, molecules themselves are the chemistry uh, of these systems. Um, I wasn't formally personally trained uh, in, in chemistry itself, but uh, a lot of the chemistry we're studying is in fact physics at its core, it's physical chemistry. And so, uh, yeah, studying these systems, you know, you can treat your molecules as interacting partners and their reactions, the probabilities, there's a lot of statistics in there. Are they gonna, you know, tend to form something like methanol? Are they gonna fragment to pieces? And so there's a lot of math and physics baked in. Um, and so I, I really like that perspective that it, the chemistry and the math and the physics and the astronomy all come together and, and give us this really uh, fun, multifaceted view. So, so it was a, it was a, a, a long path, but uh, you know, it's an incredible field to be working in. I, I think, you know, protoplanetary disk science, I, I, it is rapidly growing, you know, does, puts it so lightly. Uh, every single day, almost, at last I calculated, over the last five years on average, um, I calculated that nearly two papers came out, two refereed papers came out every single day on protoplanetary disks. So it, the, the literature is just impossible to keep up with. It's such a rapidly growing field right now. Um, I feel bad for my graduate students trying to keep up with everything going on in the world <laughs> and like also the historical literature, everything on top of that. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of that was my general path to getting here. Um, but it's it's not the only path. Uh, you know, my students have very different backgrounds. My postdoc have very different backgrounds. And I love fostering a, a group that has that's just uh, that that comes from so many different perspectives. So I think we've actually exhausted the questions in the Q&A. Um, so unless one pops in just now, I think uh, we can thank you again and um, wish you much success in, in your work going forward. Um, thanks so much for being our um, speaker tonight. Thank you everyone for joining. All right.